ladies, gentlemen, and disappointments. We are coming to you live from the Woman Caves in New York and Connecticut. My name is Leslie. And my name is Melissa. And we are Verbally Disastrous. Hello, everyone. This is your host, Leslie, from the Verbally Disastrous podcast. The topic for this episode is about the time I lost my shit on a job site. According to electrical theory, I popped my GFCI and wanted to absolutely kill this asshole on the job. Now, a GFCI is an acronym for a ground fault circuit interrupter. This altercation went down while working on the Royal Bank of Scotland project in Stamford, Connecticut. This project, known by the acronym RBS, was a brand new job coming out of the ground back around 2007. A brand new job that has brand new everything is known as a deck job. I got to work for the largest electrical contractor that was responsible for the majority of the electrical work on the project. For about a year or more, we all worked on installing large and small conduits, main electrical panels for each floor, transformers, wire poles, and wire terminations. I enjoyed the experience of doing this type of work. I got to work with some good guys as my partner. The hard part was working during extreme weather conditions. Due to not having enclosed walls, we worked through the gusts of cold wind in the winter and heat and humidity in the summer. The building has 12 stories plus the basement and has 540,000 square feet of space. The RBS building is located right next to the I-95 South ramp and the highway, and not far from the Long Island Sound. In the winter, the, the wind gusts on the upper floors were well over 40 miles an hour. It is one of those jobs that was brutal to work the regular shift and overtime. For most of the year, we worked 11 hour days and Saturdays. I saw people run out the door (laughs) and enjoy their summer. By the time the 2008 recession hit, those guys who didn't work over the six months previously were bitching and moaning at coffee break. Too bad. This business is feast or famine. Now I'm going to briefly describe the process on a deck job in the simplest way. On a deck job, the only thing erected is the building steel, the metal deck pan, and the perimeter is surrounded by wire rope to protect workers from falling off the side of the building. We have steel being erected overhead with a crane on the floors above until it is finished. Boy, we sure trust those iron workers. Once all of the steel is erected, the American flag is erected on the highest point by iron workers. Now, when you drive by a job site, look for the American flag to see if the steel of the building has been completed. Job sites used to have a topping off party and serve lunch, a long standing construction tradition for the crew. I have not been on a deck job in a while, so I am unsure if the general contractor still follows tradition. After we installed the conduits on the metal pan, the masons came along and laid down the rebar. Next, they covered the conduits and deck with concrete with a four to six inch or more pour. Once the deck is cured, we can walk on the new deck and continue working. The interior walls 
were gradually be being built with bricks by the masons. Prior to the installation of the staircase, we had to climb temporary wooden ladders. We had a temporary elevator on the outside of the building that was meant to just move material and equipment. Risers are a series of vertical 4-inch round conduits that come up from the basement through each floor and all the way up to the roof. These risers provide power from the source to the furthest point of power required on the roof. During the altercation I had with another dude, I was working with my partner on the riser conduits. I don't even want to call the dude a tradesman because of his shitty behavior. His whole crew was involved in the nonsense for quite a few weeks. This nasty dude was working with at least six other dudes in his clan. If I was to guess... These dudes were no taller than four feet high. I'm exaggerating. These clowns were maybe five feet tall, tops, and all of them were of Hispanic descent. Let me stop roasting those stupid motherfuckers. Each and every one of them walked around the job site like they hated their jobs and life in general. Their body language and behavior just seeped of anger, hate, and we really don't want to be here. I can certainly understand being pissed off every damn day if I had their job. These fools were the people who spray Monocote onto the steel beams all day, every day. Monocote is an absolutely disgusting substance that is super hard to get out of your hair and clothing after making contact with it in the ceiling. I would use a do-rag and plastic bag on my head when I worked on plaster removal over the years. I didn't work with Monocote long enough to justify that setup on my hair. Besides, it would get hot as fuck. I'm sure by now you want to know what the hell the substance is and why is it even necessary in the first place. Monocoat is a fireproofing substance that is used on steel beams. The objective of Monocoat is to reduce the temperature of a building's steel beams during a fire. If the building's steel during a fire is properly insulated, it keeps the steel from getting super hot twisting under duress, popping the connective hardware, then collapsing. Now, when the integrity of the steel is maintained, people in the building can safely get out during a fire. Additionally, it gives first responders time to extinguish the fire in the building. On the bag, it is banned in California because it is suspected of causing cancer. On the job, we used to joke that it causes cancer in Cali, but New Yorkers are safe. <laughs> Years ago, one key ingredient was asbestos. It has since been removed. Nowadays, some main ingredients are gypsum, slag wool, Portland cement, vermiculite, fuller's earth, calcium hydroxide, bauxite, kaolin clay, mica, carbon black, and chemical accelerators. The best way to know exactly what is in it is to ask the safety officer on site for the safety data sheets. When Monocote is wet, it has a heavy, clumpy, and super wet feel. I would describe it as what a mix of very wet cat litter and popcorn-style attic insulation would feel if they were blended together. <laughs> when Monocote dries, somehow the form changes from that consistency to a fine powder. While you can knock off a clump of it, most of it's very dusty. 
supposedly if you knock a chunk off the steel you're supposed to mix a bag and patch up the missing section i'm pretty sure that maintenance is not running around patching up exposed beam sections hopefully by this point you've gotten a sense of how nasty and disgusting that monocoat is to have to deal with on the job it is one thing to have to deal with it here and there on the job it is another thing for these guys to systematically spray things on the job on purpose having these guys repeatedly do this on the job for weeks really worked on our patients those dudes were working off scaffolds and using old father time pneumatic equipment to spray the monocoat onto the beams it made sense to clean this up while it was wet to minimize having the dry fibers airborne on the deck in hindsight we were foolish to only be wearing n95 masks while these dudes were in the same space wearing respirators according to the sds sheets an n95 mask is the minimum requirement i'm guilty of not wanting to always wear my n95 mask I'm sure I will pay for it someday when I'm an old broad. <laughs> that was one good thing about not having walls to trap this monocoat dust in. During the rare occasion where we would try to interact, these monocoat guys came over to ask my crew to move the huge bundles of 4 inch EMT conduit to a different spot on the deck. EMT stands for electrical metallic tubing and is intended to protect wire for indoor locations. I had taken note that day that they didn't interact with me. It was weird how they were trying to ask everyone in the crew but me. <laughs> for the record, I am not offended at all. I made the observation, took a mental note, and found it rather humorous. I had even observed one of the guys that had approached my apprentice. He stared at them like a deer in the headlights. Another humorous observation. Eventually, those clowns figured it out that the bundles were not being relocated. Even if I was approached, I was not honoring the request either. These bundles of 4-inch EMT weighed 393 pounds. They were not getting moved without a pallet jack. We didn't even have a pallet jack on the floor either. We were not taking the unnecessary time that would have been required to break the pallet down either. If we would have played their stupid game, we would have moved that bundle all over the floor multiple times. Besides, both our general foreman and foreman would have gotten pissed at us for wasting time on that bundle. Meanwhile, they were working on scaffolds that could have been adjusted and straddled over the bundle with their scaffold and worked around it. They were just being lazy and trying to avoid adjusting their scaffold. In response to not moving the bundles, these morons sprayed the ends of our conduits on each end of the bundle. I remember my partner cackling with his signature laugh. <laughs> Upon the discovery of the conduit ends on the bundle, we laughed at it despite it not being funny at all trying to make light of a, a shitty situation. I'm glad that I had taken and saved pictures of the bundles that were sprayed. Yes, by 2007 our cell phones had cameras in them. I may have not had the same quality of pictures that we have today. Regardless, I was building my case against these clowns. I don't recall ever previously working around such a nasty, spiteful group of humans. These same guys had previously sprayed an iron worker in the face. It was passed off as an accident. After my own encounter with the scaffold of midgets, I knew that this wasn't an accident at all. Now that the 
temperatures were plunging, they were having to install huge tarps in sections of steel. In addition to the tarps, they were running heaters within the tarped sections. I am assuming that the Monaco wet solution was freezing up and making the application process a challenge. The bonus to working in the heated tarped area was getting access to heat. It came in handy when working on upper floors that were extremely cold and windy in the dead of winter. However, the drawback was having to endure their terrible behavior. We were continuing our work on the series of four inch risers that were located towards the center of the space on each floor. The conduits came up through the deck and continued to the floor ahead. For each opening in the deck, we had to create custom plates and mounted support strut on the inside of the opening. The metal plates were adhered with hardware to the strut. Additionally, the proper holes were exactly punched out for each conduit size that was going through the opening. Once completed, the masons would use the metal pans and fill them with concrete. All holes were properly fire stopped to make the deck resistant to fire. This task had to be performed systematically and methodically for each floor. For every 100 feet of conduit, we had to install giant pull boxes onto the conduits. We would leave for the day and return the next morning to discover an unexpected surprise. The Monaco guys were not even working in the area for fuck's sake. They came over after we left for the day and sprayed our conduit ends with Monaco. The crazy thing is that we didn't even say as much as a word to these guys. This was a totally unprovoked attack. By this point, I was seeping with anger for these fools. Instead of installing our large pull boxes, we spent the first hour filling the air with dry Monaco dust after scraping the conduit to get our connectors on the conduit. As soon as I saw the mess, I brought my foreman over to document the attack. Upon initial sight, he was just as disgusted at what happened as we were. Of course, he had picked our brains about the events that had taken place the day before. We had zero interaction with them the day before. There was absolutely no reason for this nasty mess. I will admit that after this incident, I had given my signature death stare upon each and every opportunity. One of them caught my gaze and attempted to smirk back at me. Over the years, we are not above pulling silly pranks on each other. Pranks would only be pulled between people we actually liked. We did not make friends or enemies with this group of trolls by this point either. For whatever reason, these clowns upped their activities. When some of our crew members were walking through the space, one of the idiots actually turned around and sprayed the tarp opening. Now these fools are most certainly on our radar. During lunch, their hoses had somehow gotten disconnected. Apparently, they had an issue with their equipment after lunch. I wasn't involved with that, but I know who was involved, and I was pleased. After some more sporadic interactions, we went home for the day. We totally expected some form of an attack on our equipment that night. At the time, we had no idea what was in store for us the following day. It was pouring rain with high winds the night before. Every morning, we shaped up in the shanty and met up with the general foreman. I was in a shanty with at least 50 other men. I was the only woman on the project at the time. I felt like the general foreman, nicknamed Harry Pig, was always observing me with the side eye with his glasses He was studying me and trying to figure me out. If I was to guess, I had an overwhelming vibe that he didn't like me. 
He would release the crew onto the field by saying each morning, Gentlemen, shall we? Before you ask if I was offended by his choice of words, I will say no. I considered myself to be, quote, one of the guys. For the purpose of working, I am not looking to stick out. I went with the flow and did what needed to be done. My partner, Willie, and I headed up to the floor to start our day. We headed up to our gang box to get our tools, PPE, and power tools. For anyone that doesn't know what PPE is, it is personal protective equipment. Hard hats, gloves, composite toe work shoes, high visibility vest or shirts, and eye protection are examples of PPE. As soon as we had gotten into the workspace, we saw material moved around from the wind. The heavy rain from the night before was pulled in the space. To make matters even worse, the scaffold of midgets went again into our space and sprayed down the conduit ends. Monaco and water was all over the place. I was glad that I was wearing my waterproof red wing boots. They were very good at keeping water from going inside my boots. Boy, did I need them that day. Both Willie and I were so pissed to see the space. We went to work on cleaning up the space before being able to begin our work. I saw a squeegee leaning on the column, so I walked over to grab it. I started pushing the water off the side of the building to get it out of our space. In hindsight, I feel sorry for anyone working the perimeter after a rainstorm. Mind you, we were wearing our heavy winter clothes. The water was just shy of freezing on the deck. Mind you, just another key detail that made this space absolutely miserable to work in. I was almost done with moving the water out of the space. One of the raging midgets on the scaffold jumped off and quickly walked my way. Instead of asking me for the squeegee, he proceeds to try to yank it out of my hand. As soon as he realized that he could not get it out of my hand, he locked eyes with me. I'm sure I was full of absolute vitriol and hate for these clowns. It was as if everything they had done had bubbled to the surface at that moment. When we locked eyes, I saw fear in his eyes. Our faces were covered with masks, so that is pretty much what you could see. We were in a tug of war, and I was not letting go. No amount of him yanking was going to pull it out of my hands. I heard my partner, Willie, with his signature laugh behind me. He then starts to dig into the guy. You should have asked nicely. You had no idea how strong Les is. She is former military. She's very tough and she's going to kick your fucking ass. You shouldn't have messed with Les. You have no idea what you have just done. I heard his chuckle in between sentences. It was his signature. <laughs> At some point, I started screaming at this idiot. I was calling him every name in the book. <laughs> it felt like we were suspended in this pose for hours. Before I know it, my straw foreman, Felix, was yelling in my ear. Willie was in the background telling Felix that he walked into our space to try to yank the squeegee out of my hand. The midget was getting the surprise of his life. Felix kept asking me to let go of the handle, to where I replied, Fuck him! He's an asshole! They have been doing nothing but fucking with us! They have been doing it for a long time, and it needs to stop today! Then Felix started begging me, Please, Leslie, 
please let it go. I'm begging you to let it go. I must have snapped out of my anger zone. I responded, Okay, Felix. <laughs> I let go of the handle, and the midget went flying backwards with the entire handle at least 10 to 15 feet. As soon as he realized he was free, he ran away from the space. It was probably at that point where I figured I was getting laid off that day. I was perfectly fine with what was coming down the pike. I had assumed that the story would somehow get twisted against me. I honestly didn't care at that moment. I was beyond angry at that moment. All the years I have worked with the tools, I have never been to this point of big mad. By this point in my career, I had been in the union as a journeywoman for 12 years. I have dealt with people who were super annoying. I've been locked out of shanties until 7.01 a.m. and falsely accused of being late. This was the first time I encountered a group of super spiteful people. Don't get me wrong, the average guy is not super happy to be there. This is especially true under the most miserable conditions. However, we all have a job to do. We're just here to build America and get the hell out of there and go home to our families. No sooner did I compose myself and get back into scraping Monocoat off, Felix came up to ask me to follow him. I had quickly stolen a gaze at Willie of disgust and then proceeded to follow Felix like a puppy downstairs. Felix leads to this big circle of white hats, all nicely dressed in suits, on a vacant floor. Standing next to my foreman is my general foreman, gazing at me in a stern manner. I felt an increased sense of anger and anxiety building inside of me about this in impending shit show. It was that uncomfortable a moment when you know that all eyes are on me. <sighs> Here we go. A general contractor manager serves as the host of the powwow. He approaches the male monocote subcontractor. He is nicely dressed, yet looks like a working man. Monocote boss is wearing clean jeans, clean boots, and a collared button-down shirt. Meanwhile, the monocote troll stands next to his boss while trying his best to look like a damn polite angel. I feel like... Harry Pig is burning his eyes into the back of my skull. He is carefully studying my every move and word. This was a moment of peace before the storm comes. The general contractor manager first looks towards the Monaco boss and troll and asks him, So, tell me what happened. This troll looked up at the tall man with a smirk and has the nerve to say the following. I asked her nicely for the squeegee and... Now this lie was told in his most polite, best version of English he could possibly muster. If you saw his group's behavior, you would definitely say his words did not match his previous behavior. The moment I heard his filthy lie, I felt an absolute surge of anger, rage through every part of my body. How dare this troll spew this complete and utter bullshit? I snapped like I have never snapped in my entire career. I probably had the ugliest and scariest expression on my face. I turned to that troll and screamed loudly, YOU'RE A LIAR! I went on to scream about every fucking nasty thing these trolls have ever done to anyone on the job. All of you done was purposely spray people, muddy up our work, and think you can bully us. This, it needs to stop today. I took my index finger and repeatedly pointed it into that fool's chest. I'm sure he had bruises on his chest. For every pound into his chest, his body and face responded with a squint and a shimmy. As I was yelling at the ugly midget, 
I heard several voices loudly asking me to stop. I think it was Harry's voice that got me to back down. It was like I was in a zone where I was temporarily out of my body. I always tried to avoid getting to this level of anger. After that encounter, I believe that people can lose their damn mind and do things that they wouldn't normally do under regular circumstances. I'm speculating that my desire to want to throw the troll off the side of the building probably lasted for at least 30 seconds. Once I backed off my angry homicide mode, I stole a glance in Harry's direction. He threw back at me a look of satisfaction. His, quote, proud father facial expression kind of snapped me out of my rage. My demeanor calmed down and I faced the general contractor mediator to tell on this fool. I rattled off how these trolls purposely tried to spray my co-workers at the tarp entrance. I continued to tell him about how every damn morning for the past few weeks we came to our space that was vandalized. I told him to investigate just about every coupling in our riser. There was a monocoat residue on every riser on every floor. I pulled out my cell phone and shared the photos of the tarp section where these guys sprayed the openings in an effort to try to get a worker. It was after viewing my photos, the manager told the monocoat boss to look at the photos. He then continued to tell the monocoat boss and troll that they were to steer clear of this lady and her crew. This good news was music to my ears. I had a hard time containing my desire to grin at the troll. The manager warned the Monaco boss that the Monaco trolls have one more chance to peacefully exist on the job. The manager advised me to come to him directly if I observed any more issues from Team Trolls. I said, thank you, and walked away to my floor to get back to work. As soon as I get back to the space, I hear Willie's signature <laughs> before I even see him. It was almost like he was watching the stairs and waiting for me the entire time. Willie approached me and said, so kid, How'd it go? I gave him the blow-by-blow blow account and told him I shared the photos of the tarps. He laughed and said, See? No one fucks with Les. He then reflects, You should have seen the fear in that midget's eyes. He made a huge mistake fucking with Les. He goes on to dish on our foreman. Poor Felix. He didn't know what to do. You had them all flummoxed and discombobulated. It was great. <laughs> when I recount this story, I have Willie's unique laugh and voice in my head while I recount the events. A few years ago, I had heard that Willie passed away not long after retiring. He will be sorely missed by many. Rest in peace, partner. For some reason, not long after the incident with the White Hots, I changed partners. After all, we finished the risers and moved on to new tasks. We got to start installing equipment in electrical closets. I earned a new partner by the name of Benny. Benny is a short Italian guy with a slim build who's a good electrician. Since my son Tom has been in the business, he also got to work with my old partner, Benny. As soon as I teamed up with Benny, he asked me to recount the story. I had given him my version of events that made him laugh. One day when I came down to the shanty for lunch, I heated up my food in the microwave. In came Harry, ahead of schedule. He stood next to me and others nearby. To my surprise, he went on to brag about my encounter with the troll that day. You should have seen this girl. She was going to kick the shit out of that guy. You don't want to step in the octagon with her. His rendition 
in his high-pitched voice of that day made me grin and bust out laughing. I sarcastically told him, Thanks for holding me back, Harry. You kept me from throwing his little ass over the metal rail. We exchanged small talk for a bit, and then he left. I sat down and finished my lunch with great satisfaction that the general foreman now liked me. Any time he saw me in passing, he said, I don't want to step in the octagon with you. I laughed and kept it moving. He came into our closet and caught us working. Harry said, Why is it that every time I walk in, I always catch you working? I explained, That's easy, Harry. I stand outside the door all day awaiting your arrival. I jump into action the minute I see you. One day, Harry revealed to me my personal nickname with a devious grin while I was moving switchgear with my crew. I have a new nickname for you, Leslie. It is Fabulous Moolah. Of course, I googled this name when I went home later that night. I discovered that the name belonged to the first female wrestler by the name of Mary Lillian Ellison from the WWE. Fabulous Moolah wrestled and won her first match back in 1956. She was later inducted into the WWF Hall of Fame by 1995. This legendary wrestler passed away in 2007 by the age of 84. She passed away the same year I was working on that project. For the rest of the time I was on the project, Harry would refer to me as Moolah. I found it humorous each and every time. I ended up ripping ligaments in my ankle on that project while watching my son at a football game. I had taken a little time off at the time, but it didn't allow it to heal. Scar tissue formed, so I needed it surgically removed. I left that job by December of 2008 and had gotten laid off while out healing. To this day, I still remember how I felt and the details around that project. By the time I left that project, the 2008 recession occurred. It made work scarce for quite a few years. Overall, I learned a lot on that job and made some great memories with my co-workers along the way. One co-worker I had adored from the RBS project that recently passed away was Scott Gross. He was a funny guy, full of life, and will be missed. I remember his smile and funny commentary on the fight with the midget. This episode is dedicated to you. May you rest in peace, buddy. Asterix. Names. Names have been changed of my co-workers to protect their identity. This wraps up another episode on the Verbally Disastrous podcast that can be found on Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube. For more information, head over to www.constructiontales.com. Thank you for listening, and have a great one.